Hey folks, uh, AMA for Core Subsystems. Uh, Hello. Starting now. Hello. Uh, thank you, Joey, for suggesting that we do this. I think this is a wonderful idea, and I think it's fun. Really productive. So this is going to be the format for it. We hit up a bunch of folks, and a bunch of folks uh, uh, volunteered an issue to introduce uh, a subsystem that they find themselves familiar with, and then we will open up to questions. Um, simple enough, uh, we'll get started. We'll look for folks here. Uh, also want to say if you are familiar with a subsystem or if you've worked on it, uh, feel free to answer the question, uh, even if maybe that subsystem is mentioned here attached to someone else. Um, oh, okay. It's, uh, you can't see everything, but first, uh, Anatoly, would you like to introduce a couple? Hey everyone, um, I'm Anatoly. I'm a member of the um, TSC. I contribute to Node uh, primarily these systems. So um, I'm mostly able to answer questions related to HTTP2 compatibility, um, which is basically the layer that allows you to run HTTP2 servers the same way you would run HTTP1 servers. Um, also familiar with timers. I don't think I need to really explain timers, hopefully. Um, and process, I mean, really what I'm familiar with is task queues. Um, so if you're interested in how Nextic works, if you're interested in um, how um, Q microtask works, if you're interested in any of those um, kind of finer details of, of how the event loop functions, um, I'm happy to talk about that. Super. Thanks, Anatoly. Uh, next up, we'll get your to introduce a couple. I'll come to you. Hi everyone, I'm Grish uh, from IBM, based in Bangalore. So basically the areas which uh, I look at those who wanted before, before is uh, basically diagnosis before. Uh, if you take a snapshot of the Node.js uh, application and provides you with all the insights about all the different uh, information which is coming from different uh, subsystems, perhaps the image, perhaps the key. The call stack and the queue the information, etc. So basically, it will improve the diagnostic capabilities of the node.js problems. Embedding is basically to uh, embed the node.js into other native applications and run node.js workload in different uh, threads. Child process is basically to spawn new processes with Node.js as a parent thread and effectively communicate with the child for data transport and have some piece of workload uh, run through the child process. Shared library is mostly related to embedding. If you want to embed uh, Node.js in other applications and consume Node as a shared library, the key difference would be uh, running Node as part of another process as opposed to running as a standalone application. In the UV, I'm not as such an SME, but I have some understanding about the different tools, the event based architecture, and how the, uh, the, you know, the, the main trunk of the node communicates with the human infrastructure. So uh, I'm happy to talk about that if you have any questions. Hi everyone, I'm Matteo, you probably know me, I don't know. Uh, um, as you might know, uh, I am more or less with some other folks maintaining node streams, which is probably the most legacy piece of very nice code <laughs> <laughs> that is in, in Node.js and uh, on a long quest of trying to make this a little bit more maintainable and a little bit more usable. And you know, not really uh, such a mess. Um, you know, maybe we'll see where we are at. Everybody relies on those behaving on any certain way. So for anything that we are changing there, we break ten things. So that's uh, that's my life. Ten bucks for everyone fixed. Um, uh, I'm also because of the reliance on streams. I'm also one of the um, I got. Up to maintaining uh, HTTP, more or less, and uh, I have been involved in HTTP too, more or less, from from the beginning. 
So yeah, um, that's me. Uh, I'm also very much interested in async iterators. So I've added async iterators to streams, and you know I'm interested in all those stuff. So if you would like to talk about those, also shout a question. Um, hi, I'm Anna. Uh, I don't want to do a long introduction, but uh, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have basically been all over the place in Node. Uh, I mostly work on, on things that touch C++. I don't know how to try to do yeah, I don't know, sorry. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm doing that. It, I'm famous for anything, it's work on threads and notes, but yeah, don't really want to say anything more. <laughs> hey, I'm Ruben. So, uh, yeah, I mainly maintain UTL. I pretty much rebuilt it from scratch, I think, in the when from version eight on, uh, we factored to become more performant, especially with like Qt inspect, which was like super slow when you did console log and would slow down your application because of synchronous code. Well, that's not the case anymore, uh, happily. And um, yeah, I'm trying to uh, improve uh, the uh, output um, also when you uh, put something weird in there so it can pretty much uh, reconstruct a lot of information, no matter like, how you manipulate your objects. Um, and uh, yeah, buffer, okay, I don't know the native site pretty much at all. What I mainly did is like all the read write functions at some point to uh, replace them, um, have like first implementation with super basic binary stuff. Uh, like, you don't want to look at it. And, um, and then, Hello. Uh, yeah. uh, then uh, assert. Well, I also pretty much rewrote that, um, and uh, it has a relatively decent comparison function in there, which became a uh, util is deep strict equal. So that's the um, functionality to compare to uh, different objects, and it uh, worked pretty well. Then, uh, yeah, it has, I don't know, like a nicer way with assert throws, better uh, arrows and stuff like that. Uh, so it was uh, pretty horrible for a long time. Uh, it was like, don't use this stuff. <laughs> but since it's in no core, I started to work on it, uh, especially also we use it in, in core, obviously, for everything in testing. And, um, and I think now it's pretty usable, at least. It's still, uh, it, it could still be improved further, but um, that's a different story. Yeah, REPL, uh, I would say that's probably the worst code in whole no core. <laughs> <laughs> And um, yeah, it's super difficult to work with that at all. Uh, you use it probably while working on Node Core because you want to have a REPL. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We should replace that thing. Um, uh, pass. So the pass module is very basic code again uh, to, to have uh, pass manipulation. Or, or uh, to, to join different passes and so on. Um, you don't want to look at the code, but it's, it's, it's fine. It works fine. It's just, it, um, it's fast. And uh, in this case, the code is also written well. It's just more complicated because it's very basic uh, to be so fast. Um, yeah, and benchmarks, anything that has to do with that at core, I do a lot of performance optimizations. So, yeah. Tobias? Yes, 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 yes. Ah, yeah. Hi, I'm Tobias. I mostly work on crypto, probably one of the least popular modules in Node Core, but sadly necessary. It's mostly because we bundle OpenSSL or um, Electron Balance, uh, I think it's Libra SSL by now. Not entirely sure. Um, so, we do have a built in crypto module, and it is used widely, but only by a few modules, which are then dependent on by far more modules. and um, we do try to support all new algorithms that are popular on the web, everything that web crypto does, but the problem is that um, OpenSSL, which we depend on, does not really support all new standards, so we have to try to keep up with them, and they have to try to keep up with the standards. So I added a lot of features to the crypto module within the last two years, and I added a lot of bugs, and I fixed a lot of bugs, and uh, probably spent more time debugging OpenSSL internals than Node itself. So hopefully I can answer any questions you have about the crypto module. Thanks. 
Super. Now we have Sam. Uh, hey there, um, I'm Sam. I worked a bunch on the cluster module and the TLS module lately. Um, if you're not, remember we're supposed to define how people modules do. If you don't know what cluster is, don't use it. <laughs> if you are using it, I'm actually kind of interested in knowing that your experiences can find me sometime and talk to me. And lately I've been working on TLS bunch. I added uh, with, with you know, the Shigeki and a bunch of other people, TLS 1.3 support. Um, anyhow, and I have anything but an encyclopedic memory. So you can ask me anything. I don't promise to answer anything. <laughs> so we're, we're done with the intros now. Now it's the anime time. Um, we have two mics. Uh, I'll bring them to you. Uh, or we might help each other out by bringing them to each other. Uh, oh, there's a question already. Yeah, so this will be a question for Tobias. Uh, so both Chrome and Electron obviously use uh, Boring SSL instead of uh, OpenSSL, and they diverged, I think, two or three years ago. Um, is there any consideration of switching to Boring SSL instead? Because that would make it beautiful with browsers, or at least on browsers. Well, the problem with that is that Boring SSL as Google themselves write on the front page of the Boring SSL wiki or documentation, or whatever it is, they actually write that it's not supposed to be used by other than by other companies or people than Google themselves because they don't guarantee any stability. They don't make any, at least they don't publicly make any um, guarantees towards that. And um, I think there were problems with some newer OpenSSL APIs that aren't fully implemented, such as some key generation features. I'm not sure whether that changed. I think Shelley looked into that. Um, we tried to keep it as compatible as possible. So we added a couple of um, C++ magic to make it work mostly, but we don't currently. So we are trying to make it possible to swap it out, but we are not trying to replace it currently. Okay, thanks. I'd add two things to that. One of them, yeah, they don't have an LTS support plan, so it's kind of a non starter. Um, and they don't have FIPS, which, if, for people who don't care, they don't care, but if you do care, it's really important. So it's not. What was that last one? Remember what? Uh, boring SSL doesn't have FIPS unless someone left correctly. And yeah, there's no FIPS support. Uh, well, neither does no, it uh, no, it does at this point, but we won't pass to December until uh, for a few months. There's going to be at least a few months gap. Openness self fix is still in, in flux. I'm going to start looking at it soon. But uh, yeah, for openness self self, there's going to be a gap, which means that Node will have a gap with no, no fix. It's unfortunate, but that's what it is. Hi, um, I have a question for Mateo. Uh, so Mateo, um, you said you were interested in async iterators. Yes. And uh, so I just want to, I want to let you know that like my colleague who also works at Goku, Valerie Young right here, purple blue. Um, Val actually wrote a bunch, if not all, of the, a lot of the tests for async iterators. A small number, okay, whatever. She's a contributor to SES262, um, so she knows a lot about the spec, so she's a good resource on the JavaScript side. Um, but I had questions along, like, can you, can you elaborate on what that means? Uh, like, are you trying to, like, yeah, I'm, just async iterators are amazing. Yeah, a um, couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, last year, uh, DWR to add a uh, not 10 uh, async iterator support to streams. And right like this May, something like that, we moved, removed that from experimental. So right now, uh, node streams are uh, async, async iterable. So you can iterate, you can consume a stream fully using async iterators uh, with the full uh, back pressure support on that. Um, we have recently adding, added a, a readable dot from method so that you can pass in an async iterator and get a stream, a stream out of it. And uh, we are going to look into supporting async iterable for with the async iterators in the pipeline, uh, in the stream.pipeline uh, function so that you can process a, a, a stream of data 
uh, just using async iterators. So basically, you can take a you know a file and then you know combine it into uh, with an async iterator and then pipe that into another file and all of these writing more or less idiomatic JavaScript without having to deal with the uh, legacy node struct called it legacy but that's my take on it uh, the node stream API that you cannot really change so um, that's more or less my my current uh, uh, working plan on top of this uh, we are currently talking, myself, Benjamin, and a bunch of other folks, about adding uh, uh, um, some async iterator support on top of uh, event emitter. So you basically can get a stream, uh, a flow of events uh, on, out, of event, out of an event emitter and consume that using an async iterator with an async iterator. So those are the main things that we are currently focusing on. And uh, at B, if you want to know more, I ask more questions and so on. So there's a lot of things to do. These are exciting times. Those are, this, this is a nice feature, very, very nice feature of the language. Also with no dates and setting at the end of the year, which means that in more or less six months time, uh, all LTS versions of Node would have uh, async iterator support. So essentially it would be my best recommendation to consume streams. Is there any more questions? Okay, so my question is, there's, I have an agenda, sort of, with my question. <laughs> um, so I'm really curious, since this is like a very valuable session, by the way. This is my first time here. I'm like literally mind blown right now. Like I want to take a photo with like all of the people on the all the keys <laughs> at some point today but um so thank you for your service everybody here um but my question is specifically on uh what it means to i guess do you have a sense of how many how many folks that are running node.js in the wild are transpiling um their server code do you guys have like a jet like if you have just like a like a, like a rough wild guesstimate i'm just curious it's uh, transpiling and polyfilling. Mm -hmm. Like transpiling and polyfilling. Yeah, okay. I, I'm giving my answer, but you know, yeah. if somebody else has theirs, give it. You have I have uh, I my so I'm gonna answer to this. Yeah. Um in in my experience, this comes into goes into two camps. Um there is the uh, React server side rendering and view server side rendering camp, and that they need to transpile. Uh, and this is dictated by React and JSX. So that is the main reason why they are transpiling. Uh, all the folks that are running Node for microservices and APIs, most of the time they are not really, uh, a lot of the time they are not transpiling or they're not transpiling that heavily. Uh, but there is a huge amount of people using TypeScript which count as transpiling and not in, in, in some cases. Okay, so. It depends on the definition of, of transpiling. Uh, is that the code modifications are not so heavy? So um, I I see a lot of code in my work as a, I work for a professional services company. So I see a lot of code in the wild. And you know my recommendation: if you are transpiling, do not ship any stuff that's not part of the language. Uh, that is <laughs> like no stage two, no stage one, whatever, uh, with your paper and stuff, you are going to get badly, badly hit and by by those. Um, as far from this, it's uh, more or less, I would say more than 50% of no deployment are, are I don't know if you have. That was, that yeah. was my understanding as well. I just wanted to confirm that for the yeah. no, no, no ecosystem. Yeah, um, so, so Lori Voss, who is the Chief Data Officer at NPM, is giving a talk at JSConf EU this weekend. We'll probably actually co answer that exact question. I don't know if you're sticking around for JSConf. Yeah. Yeah, but um, I searched on Twitter, and the last time I could find him with a picture of a slide about just TypeScript, not even transpiling, just TypeScript. 46% of NPM users are using TypeScript, so that's definitely, that would definitely imply that a reasonable conclusion is that most people are transpiling. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you so much for your contribution on that. I just, just to clarify my point so that you know what I was actually asking, it, oh, it was at specifically server code. 
So I'm not so much talking about dependency code because we all know that's just the open source model, right? Like 90% yeah. didn't write, 10% invented here, right? So, um, or less for front end code. And so, uh, you know, I, I just was trying to understand how much of server application code is transpiled because if you're saying to me, Mateus, it's at least 50% likely more um, that you as implementers of these native modules, right? Um, that means that your code is actually not getting tested, right? Because um, when you're using a transpiler or polyfill, you're not using the native implementation, um, which is really problematic, right? So this is a pitch statement to my five o'clock session. <laughs> be there, or be square. But I just wanted to like put that out there. Um, and I'm curious, is that a concern for you guys as, as, as like lib authors? Is it something you even think about? Yeah, sorry if I misunderstood. No, I, no, you, I just started to ask a question, I immediately threw it into search. Trust me, you are like the bomb digging. Thank you. I guess, yeah, just library authors. I, I, oh, sorry, authors of these native modules, are you concerned that your runtimes, while, like, let's say they're getting run, like, magic number, they get run 100 times a day, there's 100 node applications a day, 50 of those are not actually, you know, using the native implementation of your set feature, they're using some hacky workarounds, right? So is that a concern for you or not? That's my question. So, so that would include like, for example, someone using Bluebird rather than native promises or something like that or? Correct. Yeah. You know, I've never actually been very concerned about that, have you? That's I not, add, that's not, that's not unfortunately, I, for, <laughs> unfortunately, yes, I add. I, you know, I, I have seen probably the worst bit of, <laughs> of node code possible in some cases. So, and every time I see this is the possibly the, I reach the bottom, that is an a wall other round of help. So. And I want to add one thing, and I'm so glad that other library authors are there. Just to be clear, a polyfill has limitations. It also has bugs. There's known bugs and unknown bugs, right? Um, your, your implementation of code also has bugs, known bugs and unknown bugs. But I'm just saying that like that matrix of bugs, known bugs, bugs, known bugs, it's like a crazy matrix um, that's like kind of crippling our, our ecosystem a little bit too. But um, but anyways, there's a question here. Uh, what was the question I was going to follow on? Uh, uh, more of a comment. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm concerned of it. I'm concerned about this uh, more from a just a tooling point of view because uh, source maps aren't built into V8 or Node.js itself, and as a result, you know, more than fifty percent of the Web being deployed, or more than 50% of the code being deployed on the web. Um, stack traces aren't correct. Uh, we don't necessarily even know, like if, from a debugging point of view, we lose a lot of context. Uh, this is a topic I'm really interested in. It would be great to, like, as a platform, understand that 50% of the code out in the wild is probably being transpiled and have more tooling and support that supports that. That's something I'm super interested in. Um, Um, just before we take another question, I was just going to add that what Joe said on the chat that they can answer questions on VM and modules. I added that there in case people are taking photos to DM people later or whatever you intend to do with it. But we were not kitted out to actually uh, put Zoom audio into the speakers. So unfortunately, we can't let them act actually answer questions live. Sorry, Joe. Hi. Um, Again, uh, thanks for setting this up. It's really great to have people to ask all these hard questions. Uh, I was going to ask about um, releases and uh, especially the old ones. I've seen numbers for 0.10, uh, 0.12 uh, download numbers, and it's really worrying. I was wondering if there's a uh, uh, if there are measures uh, that are being taken uh, in account for encouraging uh, moving on from those really old versions, even uh, version four is being used a lot uh, as well. Sorry if it's really hard to answer. Um, not sure who's going to answer this question. Uh, raise your hand. Uh, if you are, I mean, I was, 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 I
Yeah, <laughs> no worries. Um, I was asking about uh, like a active uh, measurements to encourage people to stop using like order ten, order twelve, uh, maybe like uh, sleep uh, on their like uh, something, but yeah, like the download numbers are in the thousands for both, and maybe the same thing for version four. I want to add, there are a couple of things there. We don't have the data to say that actual people are using them. There is uh, 0 0.10 and even 0 0.8 are still in some uh, .travis.yaml file out there, so it might just be bots. And we don't have any data to, to distinguish between those. Um, you know, if, I don't know if you know about this, but Express still tests down to 0 0.10 or 0 0.8 or something. Just so that you know, there is a proper package, and all the expressive system still runs on zero top ten. It's pretty amazing, by the way. Yeah. And uh, um, so, yeah, that's you know. So um, the other bit is we cannot issue new releases for those things. So that's that, that's the second point. We can't <laughs> be concise because we're over time. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The short story is there's not much we can do other than go out to social media and explain in a help people move off those things. Even if we did add some kind of switch to say, you know, this is gonna start slowing down, people just won't use those versions and slow things down, right? And it'll, it'll actually encourage them not to upgrade to those. So just, you know, strongly encourage people to upgrade. Thank you. Um, this wraps our AMA. Uh, thank you for all the remote folks who tuned in. Um, I think folks on the list are pretty much open to answer questions um, if you hit them up later. We're moving on to the OpenJS Foundation CPC session. Um, and before we get that kicked off, I just wanted to thank Owner, um, I can't see where they are now, um, who's been helping us uh, add the audio to the remote folks. Um, so that's super awesome. And thank you for all the people who have been answering questions uh, and volunteering to do so. Really appreciate it.